Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas Perez, or Nico. I work uh, at PEN America as the manager for free expression and education. And welcome to our 17th uh, free speech live event. I'm coming at you from a very loud Brooklyn uh, in New York City. Um, again, 17 um, really amazing conversations and opportunities for students at PEN America to engage with experts um, from across a variety of different free expression issues. This is a very special opportunity today focusing on art against oppression um, that we are working in uh, collaboration with uh, the Artists at Risk Connection at PEN America um, to make this uh, possible. Today's, today's free speech live event is a little bit different than our typical ones that we've hosted. Um, typically, PEN America has been reaching out to different experts to bring them to this forum to meet with our students um, in our networks. But this is our first opportunity where we actually have the students guiding the conversations. Um, the students who will be doing so today, today Nicole Manning and Christina Savio, um, they are not only graduates of PEN America's Free Speech Advocacy Institute from last summer, but they are now advanced advocates and graduates of our Global Free Expression Advocacy Program from the spring. Um, but Christina and Nicole uh, were challenged with the, uh, the project really of planning this out and deciding you know, what they wanted to have the conversation about. And it was them who came to us wanting to reach out to Casey and Ms. Safa um, for today's conversation. We're super excited to have them in the driver's seat um, to really facilitate the conversation. But before we hand it over to Nicole and Christina, and then of course to Casey and Ms. Safa, um, Julie, some remarks. Um, about the Artists at Risk Connection uh, program and, and what you all do. Of course, thank you, Nico. I think uh, that's really a pleasure to uh, see all of you and be part of uh, this this event and you know the free speech life. It's 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 kind of being uh, the cool signature event here at Pan America. So I'm super happy to be there and to be with Casey and Miss Safa. So just uh, a couple of kind of um, notes about the project I am uh, part of at Pan America, the Artist at Risk Connection. So first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Trebeau and I'm the director of the Artists at Risk Connection, uh, ARC, and ARC mission is to safeguard the right to artistic freedom of expression and ensure that artists everywhere can live and work without fear. So what are we talking about? We are talking about artistic freedom. What does artistic freedom mean? Um, broadly, artistic freedom is the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share you know, the art the advancement, but also it's the scientific advancement and its benefits. So it includes really a bundle of rights, um, the right to create without censorship or intimidation, the right to have artistic work supported, distributed and compensated for, the right to participate in cultural life, I think we all benefit this right, as well as the right to freedom of movement, association and protection of social and economic right, which is extremely important as you can imagine. Around the world, what we have seen is that there are threats against artists and they continue, those threats continue to rise at an alarming rate. Um, artistic freedom, there's a few artistic freedom organizations that do, are doing solely monitoring the attacks. Free Muse, my colleague in Denmark, are doing an annual report uh, called the State of Artistic Freedom which documents violation of artistic freedom around the world. And in their latest report, just to give you an idea of what we are talking about, they reported 978 acts of violation of artistic freedom in 89 countries and online in 2020. So wow. there are some persistent trends in the tactics used to threaten artists and creative from intimidation to travel ban, legal suits and prosecution, the restriction of artwork, harassment and detention or imprisonment, even murder. So these threats are really, um, I mean, like, are really palpable and very here and very present in many different countries. 
Um, and they are perpetrated, I think the kind of obvious perpetrator will be the state, but not always. There are a lot of non-state actors, non-state groups who are targeted, uh, who are targeting artists. Um, the states, you all know them, is like include government, police, politicians, police, military, lawmakers, but the non-state group can include extremist and fundamentalist group, religious groups, media and telecommunication company, corporation, um, and so and so. It's a very long list. Um, it's in a kind of a nutshell, the community can be a perpetrator and can be really harsh uh, as a perpetrator. Um, we also know, know that um, artists who are part of a marginalized communities, uh, such as LGBTQA plus artists, ethnic religious minorities or stateless group, as well as migrant artists are facing a higher risk by virtue of their identity. And I think one of, um, the most targeted people like artists also are women. Uh, I think there's like a very, very uh, strong, um, I, I want to make a strong call that there are many women uh, artists who are targeted because they are women. And because in their country, we cannot play in public, dance in public. Um, so, so also this is extremely important um, to, to, to raise that point. And I think in a nutshell, what we do, so we address the need of artists at risk and the organization that serve them, meaning that we are kind of a platform of resources where artists can come to us when they face persecution and we will connect them with our growing global network of resources. And since like 2017, we have the help of almost 300 artists coming from 62 countries. Uh, one of the things that we are doing, kind of the, how the bird's eye view of the field of artistic freedom with a very small field because you have human rights, freedom of expression being part of the human rights and artistic freedom being part of free, freedom of expression being part of human rights. So we tend, we tend always kind of to forget that artists can pay a really harsh price for speaking out. So we facilitate cooperation between and among human rights and arts organization, and we amplify the stories and work of artists at risk. Um, and we raise kind of the visibility of all those challenges and issues that artists face around the world. So um, this is really, I think, what I wanted to, to tell you, kind of to set up a bit uh, the, 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 the talk. Um, I, I want really to thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Casey, Ms. Safa, uh, and our fantastic student, Christina and Nancy, for putting this event together. I couldn't be more thrilled that someone did the work for me. It was like, this is, this is was like <laughs> wonderful, I have to be honest. Uh, and I'm, I'm really eager to learn from you and from this event. So now, uh, Nicole and Christina, uh, it's, it's time for you to introduce yourself and our panelists. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Nicole Manning. I'm a sophomore at Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics in New York City. Um, I've been with PEN America for almost a year now, first with the Summer in Free Speech Advocacy Institute, and then recently with the Spring Global Institute, which got me invested into this project and really interested in learning more about artists at risk and the way that we can help them and spreading more awareness to um, high school students, college students, and even adults about the ways we can help these artists. Um, now on to Christina. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, and thank you, Nico and Julie for those wonderful introductions. Um, good evening, my name is Christina Savio. I'm a high school junior. For over a year now, I have been attending PEN America's programs, including their most recent Global Institute. The Institute taught me how the United Nations addresses issues related to artistic freedom. Today, I'm excited to hear how our artists risk their, li our, their lives to confront the injustices suffered by women around the globe through their work. Pass it back to Nicole. Uh, now, I would like to first introduce Casey Wong to you. Um, he's coming to us from Hong Kong. Um, he is an interdisciplinary artist whose uh, sectors range from performance art, 
um, sound installation, even sculptures using recycled material. Um, his artwork really resonated with me as he was not afraid to stand up and speak out, putting himself into his art, um, standing up against the policies and norms the government and communist China has put against, um, put on Hong Kong, limiting um, the voice, the passion and ideas of so many people, artists and activists. And he's found a way to make the, um, the message and fight for a pro-democratic region more powerful and personal. And I'm glad that he's here with us to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I do have a little bit of uh, fear. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm not like, as you describe, fearless, <laughs> fearless warrior <laughs> fighting the Chinese <laughs> Communist Party. Yeah. No, I do have some fear, but uh, I don't focus on the fear. I try to make fear my friend and, and focus on the positive side. You know, uh, and try to shorten the, the fear uh, to the uh, uh, shortest time, and then focus for for focus on 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 uh, well for focus my on my own personal emotion, like uh, I'm doing this for myself, and then if other people saw it and if my work can empower them, then it's good. That's bonus. So I I don't like build on uh, well I'm gonna get a lot of audience and get a lot of people look at me. No, I'm not selling tickets. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is not a concert. <laughs> so, um, and uh, if, if they enjoyed it, then, and, and I, if I can empower them, good for them and good for us. And, um, but of course, you know, so, so it's, it's kind of like from, from uh, self and then uh, grow a bit outer, which is like community and then outer to the city and then outer to the country. And we can continue to expand to the universe. So, and, and positive vibe uh, transmit uh, fast. So that's what I'm hoping to achieve. I would like to introduce Musafa, a multi-talented street artist and activist. Our artist joins this webinar from her current home in Australia, but hails from Saudi Arabia. Ms. Safa has used her artwork to amplify the voices of Saudi women and fueled a social movement opposing Saudi Arabia's male guardianship laws. Guardianship laws are laws that give the man of the household the decision-making power. During one of her interviews, Ms. Safa was quoted saying, if art is not subversive, then I'm not interested. Learning about Ms. Safa has taught me how much of an inspiration she is to women around the world. She is here to deepen our understanding of what it's like to experience censorship and how she has handled authoritarian governments that try to oppress her way of expression. Um, thank you, Christina, for this generous introduction and your thorough research. <laughs> I forgot I said that quote, but it still resonates with me today. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think I I, I want to agree with um, Casey about fear and not letting it debilitate you or um, stop you at your tracks. It, I, I usually channel my fear and anger into art, and that's how I actually survived during um, the time when I had been scared of the Saudi government. Um, we, it's now my pleasure to start off with our prepared questions for both of our esteemed guests. So, can you tell us more about yourself as an artist and include background? What motivates you and what is your preferred medium for self-expression? Well, maybe um, I go Casey first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I uh, actually studied architecture as my first degree from uh, Cornell University in America as well as uh, sculpture, master of sculpture from, from London in UK, uh, Chelsea School of Art and Design. And also I had a degree uh, from RMIT in Australia. It's a mm. doctoral of fine arts degree. So like my, uh, the way I look at practice or learning maybe, I, con I, I still consider myself a student of the arts. Uh, although I have a doctor, <laughs> Uh, because usually parents, they think, oh, you have a doctor degree, then you can stop learning and go to school. <laughs> but in reality, it doesn't end there. Uh, I still learn and I still um, 
um, practice in terms of making arts. So, so looking back, I think one of the uh, most influential kind of principle is where is is actually I learned from Cornell University when I was practice uh, learning architecture. The the kind of uh, manifesto or principle in the hearts of architectural practice is the good side about humanity, you know, the good side of humanity. That means uh, we are not trying to build the tallest skyscraper or the sell the most expensive real estate, but to really um, care about people and maybe bring some joy to their life through design, through uh, shaping the environment. So that's, so I carry on my practice of arts with that uh, principle in mind, humanity, right? So, but if you, if you look deeper and deeper into social problem like homelessness or, or even right now under the pandemic, <laughs> a lot of the, uh, the, the cause on, uh, can be traced back to politics. So, so it's highly related. It's not like, oh, social problem is only social problem. So, so when you talk about politics, it's, it influences everybody, not just uh, a, a small group of people. So that's why my uh, practice starts to uh, uh, answer directly to politics rather than just at the beginning of my career, uh, uh, trying to uh, resolve social problem through my art. So, so this, is, this is kind of, for me, it, looking back, it's kind of like a, a maturity of how to look at things, but, but you're not only looking at things, but looking through things, uh, you know, so you, you penetrate, you have this kind of you know, in, uh, penetrating vision to X-ray <laughs> goggle sort of ways to understand and react. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I, I come from, a back, I, I worked in advertising for a few years um, when I lived in Dubai. And um, as a career in advertising, I chose it because it was um, supposedly a creative career, but then it living in Dubai and being an advert, in advertising as an art director, that's I, what I tell my friends is uh, it has killed my soul. It sucked the soul out of me um, because I wanted to be creative. And obviously the clients don't really want creativity. They want their brand um, to follow brand strategy. And um, so I decided to just quit Dubai and quit advertising and move to Australia without knowing what I was going to do here. I just was visiting a friend and um, <clears throat> and then decided to go back to school um, and I, I did a visual arts degree. I finished my honors degree in 2012, and then I did a master's degree, and then I embarked on doing my PhD, and um, I've put that on hold indefinitely <laughs> to pursue other stuff um, because I've been um, <clears throat> in school, like in university. We, I don't know. I I lived in the states for for five years. So I, I use the umbrella term school for everything, university and college and Australians really don't like it when I say school, <laughs> they say, say uni, I'm like, all right. So I've, I've been in school since 2009 and it's 2020 now, that's like almost 12 years of schooling. So I think I'm, I'm done doing schooling and now I just wanna work and make a little bit of money. Um, what motivates me, I'm, I'm, I'm motivated by a deep sense of justice, the, 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 the injustices in the world. When I look at a society and see injustices, injustices that I can't do much about, I, I feel like it oppresses me too, even if it doesn't directly affect me. Um, and for me, art is, is, is not really a luxury. It's, it's who I am. It's, it's how I survive, um, in terms of being able to um speak for myself and and express um my my preferred uh, form of art is 
I don't like to exhibit in exhibitions because they're quite limited, but I prefer to do street art because it's um, accessible to everyone in the world, it, like in the area, or um, you don't actually have to uh, go to an art gallery and walk into it to see art. And um, for me, art on the street is a lot more accessible than institutionalized art. Um, and and as, as Casey said, I think we are, as artists, we are critical thinkers. We take really complex ideas and we engage with them in ways that um, traditional forms of expression um, don't. We have the ability to imagine a better world. We have the ability to, we don't solve problems. We present the world with a problem or reflect on a problem and, and then just leave it <laughs> for other people to, <laughs> to resolve. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think art has the potential to for us to communicate in ways that we don't. We, that language, for example, visual artists, uh, we're storytellers. We don't use language. We use store. We use visual stories to express, and and that um, surpasses language, and it's understandable and. A lot of people, if you don't speak the actual spoken language of, of something, you can actually look at a picture and read it in, in many different ways. Um, yeah, and I, I think we having being, being here in Australia has given me the chance to um, express. And I think if I were back in Saudi living under um, the authoritarian regime of Saudi Arabia, I wouldn't have been able to create the art I, I create at the moment. Um, so that's a privilege and it's, uh, I feel like it's a responsibility also as an artist to, um, that I do not take lightly. It's a, it's a huge responsibility that I, I need to take on and um, not take for granted. Uh Thank you. Um, we do have some artwork that we'd like to show um, of yours. Um, Eco, can you please put it up, please? Um, this is some of Casey Wong's artwork. Um, his piece, Everything is Fine, is what really resonated with me um, in the beginning with him. Um, just kind of how we go every day, walking past problems, pretending like it doesn't affect us, because maybe it doesn't directly affect us. But if we all come together and solve these social issues as one, it's easier than just sweeping them under the rug, because especially during this time of COVID, a lot of social problems and social injustice, injustices have been committed for minorities um, uh, from all ranges. And coming together and speaking up against it is more important than just pretending like everything is fine, like we usually do. Thank you, Saba, and she, I love your murals. They're just so colorful and realistic. And I, um, she's most known for her, you know, your guardian supplies and like, I'm, I'm not your, I do not need a guardian and I'm not your guardian. And it, it's, it's very powerful. Statement. Thank you. Thank you for introducing our work. <laughs> um, okay, for our next question, um, we're really interested in um, knowing your experience, um, how you were threatened by um, your government, um, the way you connected with artists at risk, um, and even from being threatened to your government to your experience now, um, things that you've learned, um, how you've grown, and so forth. Casey, go ahead and go first. Okay. Um... Well, we didn't choose to be uh, at risk. <laughs> I, I kind of realized I am at risk when uh, artists at risk contacted me. 
<laughs> and I realize, wait a minute, what's going on? It's probably here? not <laughs> a good name. <laughs> I can't change your name. So, I can oh, change my name. So. <laughs> so, so I kind of realized, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I'm in the spotlight. Now, I, 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 I actually, nobody uh, want to be in that position, right? So, but, but it's like the bad weather, you cannot change it. But what can you do? You can react to it. And of course, some, uh, this kind of uh, bad weather don't, 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 don't happen overnight. It, you have, I, th I guess we artists are a bit different than normal folks. Uh, we are a bit more sensitive. So therefore we can see it coming. We can read the weather and therefore are trying to change it. Of course, you know, you're the you're only human being and this, this big storm is coming. What can you do? You know, your umbrella got blown away. So, <laughs> so um, but it's better to do something than nothing. So that's why I, I, I guess that's how arts come in. And we have all seen how it uh, help whatever movement the people were thinking. We're all waiting for the first guy, right? <laughs> uh, everybody waiting. How, you know, how come nobody resisted? You look around and look for the, I don't know, the resistance, ah, the resistance army somewhere. <laughs> and you find nobody except yourself, maybe. Then you become the first one. So I guess our... Uh, kind of be uh, coming or go through the same process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like your weather analogy. <laughs> yeah, we, we have to predict storms before they come. And most of the time we, we know they're coming, not to be cynical, but you know. Um, for me, when I um, when my image first went viral in 2016, I um, against my better judgment, I deactivated all of my social media accounts for for a few days, but um, to 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 evade prosecution because I was a bit scared for my family, a bit scared for myself. I wasn't too sure what was happening, um, and within 12 hours, I felt completely suffocated. I felt like someone was actually literally gagging me because I'm like, I can't live without social media. I was never quite active on social media before I've been, I've managed for a while to uh, go under the radar with the Saudi government. They actually sponsored my studies here in Australia. And I've been, I was sponsored by them from 2010 to 2015, I think. Um, and that time I was still speaking against them. I was writing against them. All of my research talks about all of the injustices uh, that happen in the Saudi society um, with women and men equally, because you know men are far from securing their own um, um, civil rights as well and, and freedoms of expression and speech. Um, so I felt I felt the I felt the suffocation in my body because I I, I felt that I. I, I needed to speak, I needed to show my art. And um, I think a few days later, I decided to go back in social media and join the I Am My Own Guardian movement. Um, and and I, felt like, I felt that the fear was quite debilitating at the beginning. Um, but then I, I tried to overcome it and, um, and I don't regret it. I don't regret going back on social media because from that I learned I learned two things from this experience. I basically learned that um, without my voice, I don't know who I am. Without my art, I don't know who I am. It's it's a big part of me, a big part of my identity. And if you take my art and you take my voice, I I, I don't I don't know how to exist. Um, and and the second thing I learned is that I personally underestimated the power of my art, the power of art in general. Um, I didn't think that an image would get such reaction. I didn't get, I didn't think that an image I created as a personal response to institutional discrimination against me would ever resonate with a lot of different people. And for me, this underestimation um, made me kind of undervalue my my work and art and and when it went viral I'm like oh okay well maybe it is an, an important piece of work um and from that I also learned that um, 
like creating art is like you said, Casey, you create it for yourself. And if it picks up, it picks up. We don't set it out to become viral. And I think people who try to get make art, to, if, if their objective is to be viral or, or to gain fame, I don't think that's how it works. You can't reach the masses by wanting to reach the masses. You create art that for you, and if it resonates with other people, it will definitely reach the masses. Um, and, and for societies, for example, that exist under uh, oppressive regimes like Saudi Arabia or Iran or Pakistan, you'll always find that there are really thriving underground scenes where uh, people are cultural producers and they, they create art and it comes out of like uh, deep oppression and deep sorrow and, and a, and a and a deep sense of wanting to exist. Um, so I, I think the best part comes out of countries where there is where freedom of expression and speech are quite limited. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I want to follow up on that as well. The uh, the how, how to how you know in, in school they always emphasize, and also the government they always emphasize. Okay, be creative. Creative industry, creative school, creative this and creative that, as if uh, you know, as if if they have this word, then suddenly you you will be creative. But in reality, creativity have to work with limitations. Mm, that's true. The the higher, the greater the limitation, the greater the creativity. Absolutely. Imagine uh, you go back home and. You put your hands in the pocket and try to find your house key and find out it's not there. Now you will get creative. You start thinking, maybe call calling your, your aunts or, you know, try to get that backup key or maybe climb the windows. Okay. I mean, you won't cl climb the windows by yourself or, or try the chimney if you have one. <laughs> right. Yes. So, so, so without that uh, limitation, Losting, losing the key, losing the key, then uh, creative won't happen by itself. So same with the um, creative practice of arts, like uh, suppression and oppression of the uh, regime, the greater it is, of course, one side is uh, a simple reaction, or maybe the first reaction is fear. And fear will cause you to freeze. And the next step would be flight. That means run away. Mm. And then the ultimate resolution is to fight. This is known as the 4F uh, about so what soldiers can do on a battlefield. Are we on a battlefield? I don't know. I think I am in Hong Kong. <laughs> I kind of like uh, got, got uh, uh, swollen into this political mess that I am in. So I become like this... Uh, combatant unwillingly, a cultural combatant, I mean. So, mm -hmm. so if I don't fight, my culture would uh, uh, vanish. So I have these four F, four choices. I can put all my time uh, f fearing, causing me to freeze and don't, don't do anything, or I can run away. Uh, that's an option too, this, uh, or, or that means retreat, right? Run away doesn't mean you don't fight. You just kind of move your base camp into a better resource and then you, you, you continue your campaign or you fight. The people of Hong Kong have gone through uh, all four stages. Um, uh, like back in 2014, the Umbrella Movement and then 2019, Anti-Extraditional Movement. We have seen millions of people uh, on the street, and then they're all their creative strategies, black block or, or gas mask or home improvised uh, equipments and community help uh, are being used around the world, including in Myanmar recently. So, so, but but Hong Kong right now is going through this depression. I call them uh, in between campaign. So it's always like, oh, a big campaign, and then. And then you 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 dropped, and then for a few years, and then people come back again. So, yeah, creativity uh, and limitations. So don't give up too soon when uh, you face 
a lot of limitations because you, you know by your hearts that great creativity is hiding and waiting to come out. Thank you. Um, so I feel like now it's time to reminisce. Would you see your teenage self doing this form of work and advocacy, getting your voice and message out to the world? And have your ideas and understandings developed and changed over time? Um, have we lost Casey? Um, I can go first if we've lost. Yeah, Casey. you can go um, first. I'm, I'm just resetting my camera. Oh, sure. Okay. I see. Um, my teenage self. Oh my God, I can't even remember my teenage self. I grew up in Saudi Arabia in the 80s. Um, no one spoke about politics in the 80s. Um, it was one of the big taboos. No talk about politics or sex or religion. You can't challenge religion and you can't talk about sex like it doesn't exist. And politics was a big no no. So um, I, I would say my dad was political and some of it rubbed on me my mom was political in a in a more in in a smaller way not a big way within within us she advocated for me for example to go to the states and study in seattle without um having um chaperones or my dad um she advocates for me all the time as a as a divorcee um she she does i i guess i learned advocacy from my mother um and she, and I, I learned strength from her. In my teenage years, I was I was quite uh, the rebel. <laughs> I didn't really focus on um, any social justice issues. I was mostly um, I, I didn't even like art as a teenager. My 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 earliest memory of making art was. Um, when I was really young and my mom used to, don't tell anyone, but my mom used to do my art homework. I would come home and show her the homework and she would do something for me or tell me, oh, here, let's do this together. Or sometimes I would be so uninterested and she would do it for me. And I would get really upset if I get really bad marks. <laughs> and I was like, mom, we have to do something else. Um, I, I guess I've, I've only became, I think I've only became political when I came to Australia. I think I was, I was a bit living in the States. I was just really fascinated by all the freedom I already, I, I had all of a sudden as a, you know, as a young 20 year old something, I partied, I went to um, Seattle Central Community College. I studied graphic design. I, I made friends. I lived socially. And then I went to Dubai. I worked in advertising. And I wasn't quite political there either, um, but it was only when I've come here and I started to have the maturity and um, with age, I think um, I matured and started noticing um, how uh, Saudi guardianship laws affect women because for a long time, I didn't know what guardianship laws, even though I grew up in Saudi, I, they never affected me because my dad would never tell me don't, leave the country or don't marry who you want or don't do this they were quite liberal and they allowed me so many freedoms that i i didn't even know these things existed up until i came here and i wanted a saudi scholarship and the saudi government told me where is your male guardian and i'm like what male guardian um and and that's when i started realizing i'm like shit well my dad is an aging man my brothers have their own lives in saudi i can't just have them leave their lives just to chaperone me. I'm the eldest of my siblings and you're telling me my younger brother comes here so he can chaperone me while I study. I've been making my own money since I was, I don't know, 23 or 22. Um, so it was quite a shock for me. And I know it comes as a surprise for many people because I grew up in Saudi, but I lived a very sheltered life. My mom protected me from my religious uncles, um, she allowed me, I was allowed, I was one of the very few people in my family, women, uh, uh, who was allowed to swim and ride bicycles. And I was treated like my brothers. I think my parents treated me better than they treated my brothers. So I, I didn't feel like there was any injustices up until I came here in Australia. And I was like, yes, I think I need to do something about this. And I had been practicing art for a little bit, but it wasn't, I was still trying to find my voice, um, my style, and I wasn't too sure 
what I was going to make. But, uh, but then, um, when my scholarship was threatened because I don't have a man living with me in Australia, I decided, all right, this is, the, this is the topic I want to make. I want to talk about, this is the topic I want to pursue. I want to reflect on and, and take on. So teenage Safa, not so much. <laughs> Adult Safa, middle-aged Safa is, yeah, political. <laughs> well, uh, looking back, uh, I was always a rebel. Back when I was uh, your age, I uh, I'm just kind of just you know doing break dance and all this you know hip hop and all this <laughs> I still do <laughs> and uh, BMX and and just another consumer teenager uh, just rebel without a cause I think I like mm -hmm. James Dean I was like yeah. that but <laughs> so 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 you pick up all this knowledge in school and then. You read about all these great people, you know, Malcolm X, and nobody gonna give you equality, justice, or anything like that. If you're a man or a woman, you take it. Like things like this, you know. You, and then, but you you learn it and you you recite it, and then it's like, where should I use this? <laughs> right? The school don't teach you that, <laughs> and and. Uh, I think it is only after I, I, I graduate from school and start uh, being tossed around by society and the, and, and the community and the government. And then, and then the, 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 the fundamentals of yourself, I call that morality, I guess. You know, like those, all those uh, fairy tale books that we read when we were a child, how to be a good guy. <laughs> you know, if you think about all those, Books, right? They, they always teach you. Although the 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 DC comics, even the movies, right? The good guys, the Team America, or the, you know, whatever He Man, uh, or Teletubbies, they're kind of good too. Happy, go, go lucky. So, so you want to be that? You want to be that? But you need a cause, right? You cannot just like, okay, just do the right thing. But what's the right thing? <laughs> right. So, so I think until and that takes time you cannot i mean now i look back i would never even if i have the time machine to go back to the past and tell young 18 years old casey wong what to do he would just give me the middle finger <laughs> yeah if i say the same thing i say to you now it was like he was like yeah you're full of shit no, no. <laughs> it, it, it should become genuinely from yourself because you have seen and felt this injustice, uh, not because of the trend or not because, uh, you know, it's in fashion. So I think, I've, so this, uh, this awakening, this renaissance, this transformation uh, have something to uh, relate it to your, your, your structure, your morality structure what is good, what is bad. I think often younger people have a clearer definition of uh, what's right and what's wrong. And, but a lot of middle aged people, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they start to see the world kind of like grayish and then you can see a lot of older guys, they, they become like ultra conservative. <laughs> so watch out you guys, right? One day you guys gonna grow old and then you become like, oh, super conservative. That might happen too. So keep yourself young inside. On the outside, you know, dress nicely, dress young, <laughs> dress appropriately, <laughs> I think. You cannot stop that. I, I mean the aging, but you can, you can uh, keep that uh, fire uh, burning uh, so, so it won't be obscured by the dust of, of time. Yeah, that's how I uh, remind myself. And for me, humor is a way uh, to keep me young, you know, let's see who have the last laugh. That's, that's the kind <laughs> of attitude. So that might help too. Yeah. That didn't change, uh, comparing <laughs> to my teenager self to my current self. That's the same. Funny, funny movie in a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> Chinese movie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, now we're going to have questions from the audience. 
um, please try to raise your hand and ask questions. But if not, the chat is open and I will read the questions out for you. I have a question um, that can maybe get us started a little bit. Um, I'm like, I've like been burning to ask it because I have gotten into a debate um, with one of my friends from college. We've resurfaced this debate over and over um, about like the responsibilities of artists. Do artists have a responsibility to society or do they not? Are artists really just supposed to answer that call within to create because they have the talent to create and they shouldn't feel a sense of responsibility. In my mind, what's what's super awesome about this moment and about this, about having you, Minasafa, and Casey Wong is it almost seems like together, it seems like you guys are almost to me giving an impression that you're on a little bit separate sides of that kind of spectrum, if you will. Casey, it sounds like you're answering kind of a call within to create. And you know, given the you know the, the weather around you, it's it's a very, you know, it's kind of happening to you. Whereas Ms. Safa, it sounds like you are answering a call with your art to, uh, you know, with a sense of responsibility, like you said, that you don't take very lightly. And so I, I don't know if this is a point of, of friction or to make things a little bit, I guess, spicy here, but I'm just curious your <laughs> reflections on, you know, do, does the artist have a responsibility and like to, to what degree, you know, you reflect on that question? A lot of local artists in Hong Kong have uh, asked the same question recently because of the uh, political turmoil we are suffering. And, and some artists uh, decided to uh, react uh, towards uh, uh, the political issues. So politics become a part of their topic. But of course, uh, some other artists, they, they think is, uh, they see it separately. They see citizenship and artists as a role uh, to different practice. So of course they realize they're citizens, so they still go to the street, but they won't bring their art into the streets or make a painting about the issues. So they, they try to maintain the, maintain the uh, separate uh, practice. So, so the, the key words would be artist citizens, okay? Like me, I try to blend the two together because I like the old school iPhone, you know, the, the, the old school iPhone with just one button. <laughs> now there's no button, it right? It doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm an old guy, okay? I got one button <laughs> telephone. So so life is like that. Life, life, no, life is like the old school, uh, like, like, no, the, the old school telephone with a lot of buttons. <laughs> I don't know if you still remember those. Right, and, and you're, a, you're a daughter, you're a pedestrian, you're a student in school, many roles are, are written for you. But if you can simplify it and become just one button, then life seems easier to manage. So I'm an artist, I'm also a citizen. I care about my society and my community uh, and my rights. And I'm also an artist. I don't want to like I only, but I only have twenty four hours. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if if I want to be a uh, uh, um, a protester, I need another twenty four hours. So I don't want to do that. I just, just try. To, so instead of uh, separate them, I combine them. So this way is easier to manage. So when when I go to protest, I make an artwork. When I go back to the studio, I'm making something uh, about the streets. So everything are highly connected and related to the point that it become an equilibrium internally. Mm. So, so there's no conflict, no conflict against each other. But, but so, so this, um, the question is like, how do you answer the spirit of the time? Spirit of time, nobody can escape. All artists react to it. If there's a war going on outside, right? I mean, even if you, paint a beautiful flower is still because you hate that war, war, war outside and you try to look for utopia. So you, you paint a beautiful flower to reflect towards that war uh, and atrocity. So it's related still. So different artists have different reaction. Do they ha have to have that responsibility? The answer for me is no. It's a personal choice. It's not a right or wrong choice because everybody have different needs including artists. 
my uh, therapist told me. <laughs> uh, I find out, oh, I'm, why the world is all fucked up and nobody's doing anything, you know? And then so I decided something's wrong. Maybe I should go to see the therapist. And then I find out, <laughs> ah, that's why, you know, I, because I have the, this need, I want to be the good guy. That's why I want to do something. But not everybody uh, mm -hmm. needs to do something. Maybe they're so insensitive because this, this is their needs, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not good to force an artist to have this responsibility mm -hmm. to save the world. I mean, it, maybe it's a, a bit too, too, too heavy. I mean, save I that think, for the po politician. Mm, <laughs> just, just to kind of compliment, and I was like, I, I was. It took me a, a second to unmute. So thank you, Nico, for 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 for, for putting this question out. I think one of the it's a question that I put my head around a lot, especially in kind of applying for artists to different support because artists. You are like you're not in a box and you don't want to be in a box and you're multiple things at once and it's really difficult and i know that for example in in my field like like i will say the art and the activism you have this new kind of pop-up word saying art artivism so, mm -hmm. so i have seen you know artists put in a spot are you an artivist and it's like okay and i can get also how it's um how some 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 people will will see their citizen uh, responsibility very differentiated from their work uh, because their work is not looking at those issues is not looking at it's looking at something else once other artists are just have their like misafa i really want to get you your thoughts on that mm -hmm. because i feel that when an artist embedded some very very sensitive issue that you know society is living and pushing back that is another that is a kind of another beast yeah. and you are navigating in mm. what i i feel for us as as people trying to to help and support when 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 something wrong happened really has a descent because people like the perpetrator or like the state or the non-state will see you as a descent mm. uh and and the art is just a vehicle it could be something else else uh, mm -hmm. that they called your your uh your your engagement i will say mm. on that issue mm. i mean when i say artists have a, a responsibility um it's a it's a very um fluid way of saying um be responsible in representing who you are don't don't pretend to be something else don't pretend to don't please people don't create art for the institution um that's what i mean by a sense of responsibility that we have a responsibility to society and by being ourselves our true truest self by being able to express our tu truest colors and truest self that we are being responsible that way um and it's not always being responsible as in engaging with politics or engaging with um, political issues or rallying against war or making art that um, for climate change, for example, just being your true self is a responsibility that I think artists have to have to take. I always say I don't create art for institutions. I don't create art for galleries. I don't create art for museums. I have no interest in pleasing um, art institutions. I create art for me and for people who have similar values to me. Um, and if galleries or museums want to take my art, then great. If they don't, I don't care. Um, and by that, I am res being responsible and true to myself. Um, and it's interesting, Nico, that you find it as a point of departure between me and um, Casey, because I find that um, my um, how you said it happened to him and I, I I took charge of it but it really kind of happened to me as well like when I created the artwork I I didn't anticipate for it going viral I didn't even want it to be out in the world but someone took it and and flew with it um and but then the difference is that I I didn't shy away from that I I owned it I took it and I started creating murals for the movement and I think taking taking that power back i felt like i felt when my image went viral i felt like my whole world crumbled around me because i didn't know how how far how dangerous it would be for me or for my family back home and 
for me to just take it and and um, and fly with it that was a calculated risk and i want to answer to karen's question um uh, this speaks to karen's question uh, should we engage uh youth in political activism even when it might be dangerous i think you need to take calculated risks don't just take risks without um weighing your options um danger is always going to be there it's just how you if you you have to have a plan b and plan c and plan d and you always have to take calculated risk i have to like stress on calculated risks because otherwise your risk if there's no point in you making art and then going to jail for it you're going to be silenced in jail um a lot of people were asking me, will you ever go back to Saudi? And I'm like, well, there's a, even if there's 1% chance that I will be imprisoned, there's no point in me going back to Saudi just to make a point. I feel like I'm more powerful and I would have a platform and I would have, um, you know, the living in a democracy where I can express uh, gives me more power. So there's no need to do um, a, like, um, um, like uh, taking dangerous steps without actually weighing your options and, and calculate like taking calculated risks. Well, um, I want to oh. answer some of those questions on the chat room. Should I? Yeah, um, in the Should chat room is open. Yeah, because those are, those, those are interesting questions and relate uh, also to Ms. Safa important question i think my 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 term my 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 vocabulary for for facing this dangerous um uh, pot potentially dangerous situation is strategic mm -hmm. yeah i always remind myself uh to to operate in a strategic uh mode like for example when i went out to the street i already presume that I might be arrested. So what I do, I uh, use a, a black marker to write down my lawyer's number on my belly upside down <laughs> in case I got beaten up so badly and it's my turn to uh, mm. call my lawyer. I will, and I got stripped naked and I will be able to remember. I just look at my belly, <laughs> the telephone it's number. It's a wonderful exit, pres uh, exit strategy. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so you, you think for everything, right? Plan A, plan B, plan C. So is the, the situation, my, uh, it, it, it is, it won't change immediately. So you, you look further down the row and see what's your option. Sometimes the option will be forced upon you, but you have to have the foresight. So, um, the campaign don't end just because you are in jail. Sometimes it doesn't even end when you physically vanish from the planet Earth. So things uh, should be uh, calculated uh, decisively and strategically, um, balancing self-desire uh, versus the cause, because uh, sometimes they got mixed up. Um, so uh, look, when I look at um, the questions, uh, like, uh, may be dangerous, like for example, right now, I'm, I'm in the super dangerous uh, mall right now. I'm in Hong Kong and having a meeting with uh, young students from America and it's organized by, I don't know, artists at risk. This action is already super duper, it's dangerous and it's, and it's recorded, hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, um, but doesn't mean you stop there. Because that's, that's what the uh, oppression wants you uh, to think, to, to magnify this fear inside your brain. So you become your like thought police. And if you have uh, do that, then have you done that, then, then, then they don't need to even send in any policeman to get you, you'll get yourself. This is not the ideal way to think. So usually I, I, I think in, because I have this ability to emerge in, I, I can imagine the worst scenario. That's the saying about a good warrior is a good worrier. So I worry a lot. 
So mm-hmm. I think about, okay, if I, if the policeman catch me and what should I do? So, uh, should I fight back? So how can I fight back? And yeah. so I start practicing my Kung Fu again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm an old guy, right? So I start like mm. doing exercise to strengthen my power so I can run faster in case they're chasing me. That's important. Mm. And uh, I, I practice even uh, if they arrest me, then I have the, la, uh, the lullaby and stand way of answering or not answering. So this is all important. Mm. But, but uh, if you don't have a cause in, uh, and believe a strong faith, then you will be blown uh, like a dust mm. in the middle of the wind. So it's important if you have this faith, like for, for me, for example, of I believe in freedom of artistic, uh, 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 the artistic freedom. I believe in artistic freedom of, freedom of artistic expression, yes. Mm. That's my faith. That's my faith. If you take that away from me, man, I'm going to put up a wall with you, okay? <laughs> You're going to take me down? I'm going to be difficult as a price to pay. You see, sometimes we, we think uh, the, uh, the government is like a super gigantic monster, but actually I am the super gigantic monster. Look, I'm having a conference right now <laughs> <laughs> in your territory. I'm behind enemy line. So, mm. so, so this is all in the power of thoughts. Strengthen that thoughts, all right? And uh, tr- drink water and eat vegetables. <laughs> Don't smoke. Um, I, I like Thank this you. question. How do you how do you get yourself out of an artistic block? Um, artistic blocks don't usually happen to me, and my challenge is writing. So when I try to any block I have, I usually um, procrastinate, and I call it productive procrastination. So if I'm meant to make an artwork and I'm getting paid lots of money for it, I will panic first, and then. I will feel like an imposter and then I will go for a run and then read every book in my library. I'll look at pictures, look on the internet and go on Twitter, do everything in my power not to think about it. And somehow that actually works for me (laughs) because within this whole chaos of trying to avoid the task of making art or um, especially art I'm getting paid for. That's, that's, that's always um, a problem for me. When I'm getting paid for something, I get I, I panic because shit, people are valuing this. People want me to make something and, and here I am. I don't know where to start. Um, but then I avoid everything. I avoid thinking about it. Um, but by doing that, it comes to me naturally. Uh, art comes to me when I avoid doing it. Uh, it doesn't oh, I, work for everyone, but that works for me. <laughs> for me, I think uh, research is important. Like if I yeah. you know as a teenager, our knowledge uh, are limited. But as a middle-aged guy, our knowledge are limited too, right? Yeah. Because we're too lazy to click the Wikipedia to read the two or three links. So, so do some research. But even if you read 100 uh, uh, Wikipedia, you still at the final moment have to decide which angle you want to enter the issue. So I think uh, for me, that is very important. Okay, you can of course don't do any research and just kind of, oh, I'm gonna do this about this issue. But uh, usually uh, it's just first instinct. First instinct sometimes is not reliable. Mm -hmm. Uh, So do some reading and research and then ask deep inside your heart, like uh, how should I approach this problem? How should I answer the spirit of the time? Like for me, if you look at my work, uh, my work usually work with like dark humor and funny, funny things because I am a funny guy, right? <laughs> I think I am. <laughs> so so I, I would pick an interesting angle, a funny angle, and then start doing, start answering. So I feel comfortable and I feel a part of me uh, is in it. It's not homework, all right? It's not an art assignment from the art class. I feel mm-hmm. I am jumping into it with my full body. So that's important. Mm, and who was it who asked, where do, I, where, where do I find time to make art? Was someone asking that? Yeah, Jade and Lily. Um, art, most of the time, art people don't want to pay for art. So I have to actually 
find time between uh, my part-time jobs, my multiple part-time jobs to, to look for opportunities and create art. But even if I don't have a paid gig, I'm, I find myself that I'm always creating art. Um, if it's, if it, if someone buys it or if it gets picked up by a gallery or an exhibition, then great. If it doesn't, then more, the more the merrier on my walls <laughs> and on my friends' walls. So <laughs> yeah, these are all um, good questions. Thank you for so asking. So what's your favorite piece that you made? And is there any piece that an artist made that inspire you in some way? Yes, that's this one. That was a black artist I, I saw uh, many years ago. Uh, I think maybe it's outside Brockman Museum and it was snowing. And then he uh, picked up the snow and then start packing snowballs. All right, there's like big snowball, kind of middle-sized snowball and a small-sized snowball. And then he sat outside of the museum and then he's selling, selling the snowball. <laughs> <laughs> and but it's that snow everywhere, all right. But he's like sitting outside the museum. I think that's very cool. And yeah, so that's that funny. that cool. that's very cool because you think about all kind of things. You think about values. You think about the ephemeral uh, uh, quality of art. This snowball gonna melt if I pay ten dollars for it, for the big one. And then by the time I go <laughs> arrive home, it will be like a small one. So so will be water. So. So it makes you think about institution. It makes you think about uh, colors, uh, race, or oh, is he a homeless guy, <laughs> or is he a, is he a real artist? And you think about all kind of questions. So it's it's wonderful work, and and also think about um, do I have to use a, a, a expensive material in order to make my work um, more valuable? Not necessarily, right? The power of art. So that that is very inspirational. Mm. Wonderful. So I'm going to jump in here just because we're over time. Um, and then, all, but really just want to thank you so much, Casey and uh, Safa, really just for your time and for engaging with um, our student guests. I mean, I've learned so much from you both, especially about my own questions. I feel like I'm walking away with <laughs> so much more um, awareness after this conversation. I wanted to give Christine and Nicole some space here to just offer their own final reflections and, and Julie, you as well. I have a brief plug that I wanted to plug at the very end of this, but please, Nicole, Christina, uh, your reflections on the conversation. Um, personally, this has been kind of really life-changing in a cliche type of way conversation. Oh. Um, just, I've, kind of seen art not just as one type of medium or using paint or um, <laughs> kind of putting stuff together with glue and paper, but art is just expressing yourself. And I love how both of you, um, you have two different mediums, <laughs> two different experiences, but in the end you've expressed to us that art is about a connection with yourself and kind of making it comfortable for yourself. And if people connect with that, then they connect with that. And if they don't, they don't. I feel like that's kind of something we can take, not just with art, but in our own lives and with everything we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and especially being a writer and being um, doing journalism and being interested in poetry, I definitely am gonna take what you guys said and like put that into a perspective for myself <laughs> when I get frustrated with myself and my creative process in a way. So thank you so much for coming and I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Nicole. I just like to like reiterate, really, like I feel like you said, Casey, with how humor is just a way to think, to make your brain like help like when your whole life can be crumbling beside you, but you have humor to liven it up to always have looking in the positive of things and to always have that attitude that you can keep going and it is going to be okay. You just have to think some ways around it, be creative, you know, find that other way, not only with the key, but going through the window. And I love like with the Safa, you know, when you're younger, you didn't weren't really into art, but look at how your life changed and see looking at you now, like you just kind of thinking, taking a breath and thinking that, wow, this is how life can change in an instant, in an instant. And you just have to go how, you know, you have to roll with the punches and yeah. 
go with the flow of how life is and give use the gifts that God give you and use them wisely and use the brain too. And I just want to say thank you for your time. And I've learned so much and I hope everyone else here who has listened from you has experienced a good time as well. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. Just want to stay with those beautiful words with Christina and, 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 and just tell you, um, you know that it's, I'm super grateful that you could be there with us and um, Safa and Casey and and share really this this kind of your wonderful kind of stories and what what is really kind of behind the scene of the story. I learned a lot at times. I have to say I feel that I need to update a lot of different things <laughs> right now. But uh, I'm I'm super thrilled. I really want to thank Christina and Nicole for putting this event together. It was really amazing. Thanks, Nico, and I'll let you. Nico, uh, closing. Thanks. Absolutely. So for other students who um, are joining us, I see a lot of new names, um, you know, in, in the crowd um, who might not have engaged with us before. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation, enjoyed these themes, you know, liked hearing from Casey and from Misafa, um, we have PEN America is hosting another um, institute um, offering more students, you know, more opportunities like this to be engaging with experts artists, journalists, writers, et cetera, out there in the field. Um, our institute that we're hosting this summer um, from July 12th to July uh, 23rd, uh, applications are still open. They're open until next Friday. Um, financial aid is available for any students. Finances should not be a barrier to anybody applying. This is really an awesome opportunity to learn all about free expression issues in the United States and around the world and what organizations like Penn and our allies um, are doing to address them. So please, send this, um, I, I dropped a link in the chat, send it out through your student networks, um, any you know, students, friends of yours, family members even. Um, and thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, Casey and Misafa for the you know, very early hours that you were both um, putting into this from across the planet. Um, and I hope everybody has a, a wonderful evening and, and a great rest of the week. And we hope to see you at future events very soon. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May the may may the force be with you. <laughs>